Yeah, I already I already told the speakers of today. This is a session I am personally most excited about. Uh, high expectations. Why? Because when we talk about sustainability and technology, the assumption is often that it's about solutions for the global north, and often the solutions originate from the global north. But can these solutions then also um, help tackle issues in the global south? And how can we contribute to develop locally sensitive solutions? Two researchers from the uh, Humboldt Institute for Society, for Internet and Society, share the insights from their project Sustainability Entrepreneurship, Welcome, and Global Digital Transformation. And this is a project that is active in 10 cities across Africa, Asia, and Americas. And so without further ado, ado I'll just give the word to you, uh, Georg von Richthofen, senior researcher from this uh, pro uh, research group that I just said, just introduced, and Asli uh, Ali Aslan Gumushai, head of the research group. Thank you. Hallo. Ach ja, klar. Gut, dass ich noch da bin, oder? Hast du mich? Speak with my stomach on a different topic. Um. Which would be cool, it would be cool. Now, what I just wanted to say is, I mean, the, the HIC is a bit of a mouthful. We call ourselves HIC or HIC, as in the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. We are not the Humboldt who is the name giver of the Humboldt University. It's the other Humboldt, the Alexander von Humboldt, who was an explorer, which, by the way, is then linked to this topic. So, yes, together with Georg, um, I'll present very briefly um, a bit the institute, the group, and then the one specific project. And we title it Between Benin and Berlin. So for those of you who thought this is about Algeria, it is not, right? It's not between Berlin and Benin. We're not talking about the middle, right? We're not talking about the middle Mediterranean Sea. We're actually talking about work in Benin and other countries. Um, but we, we thought an alteration might be quite, quite nice. And what I think what is important about the HIC is that what we try is we try to integrate excellent research with impact, right? So we are in a way almost like a hybrid organization that tries to bring in academic research as well as impact and practice. And in Germany, there are actually quite a few of these institutes and institutions, whereas in the US and UK, you have more of these institutions that are a bit at the border between academia and practice. And that's where we also try to position our, our, ourselves. Thank you. So the, the HIC was founded in 2011. Um, we generally claim, or not only claim, we, we say we're the first German research institute for internet and society because there are others who, were, who came after us, right? So being the first is something we, we, we cherish. But now we have over 70 people working in our institute on topics like AI, democracy and, and digitalization, global governance, etc., etc., like multiple topics in different programs and groups. And I also see some Hicklers or former Hicklers in the room. Um, um, who, who also worked work with us. So different topic areas, and I think the intersection is generally digitalization and society. And in our research group, the IES, the in, um, Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Society Research Group, we try to focus on th kind of the interconnection of three topic areas. Um, the first area is innovation, entrepreneurship, kind of the business side of things, right? So we are interested in how organizations engage innovatively with, 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 with topic areas. The second one is then society. We try to engage with societal grand challenges, topics of societal interest. And then the third one is digitalization. So the work in our group will, is really kind of the business, entrepreneurship, innovation, digitalization, and society. And the interlinkage of these three is what we focus on in our group. I must say, I feel like walking behind this tree back and forth. Uh, it is a beautiful one, though. So this is the group. Um, you can see here Georg. He was a year younger then. Um, you also see others from this from the set project. Christian is up there. There's Moritz. Uh, Anne Christine is there. So this is um, our research group um, in, in The Hague. And if you are interested in this work, we have uh, right now Actually, I think there's, the deadline was yesterday. We're looking for a student assistant, for instance. But if you write in your application Bits and Bäume, we grant you an additional day, right? So right here, exclusively, you can apply for a position a day even after um, on a project on platform alternatives. So what do we actually work on? And that, this is um, 
my final slide, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Georg to, to zoom in on one of these projects, right? So the HIC, uh, the, the EES group um, with, the, with this team works on complete, uh, com uh, qu quite a diverse range of, of topics. And we try to categorize them. Obviously, any categorization is artificial somewhat. But one of the areas is collaboration and openness. And I think this is a topic we have heard in the research um, report also being mentioning that global um, topics need to be engaged with in a co coordinated and collective uh, fashion. So this is about openness. It's about um, bringing together different, uh, different groups, different actors. For instance, the Open Next, so the, every dot effectively is one project, so one third party funded project with a project leader and so on working on this topic area. Open Next, effectively, I mean, very briefly put, we all know about open software, etc. What about open hardware? And especially in times of COVID-19, if you think about 3D printers, for instance, back then, how do you create open hardware that can be used globally um, quickly? Right. So that's a project on this. AI and knowledge work is a project that Georg also leads. So he leads actually two projects at the same time. I'm not sure whether you do it Monday, Tuesday, or Monday morning, or day and night, maybe day one project and night the other project. But so AI knowledge work is about the future of work. Right? And one of the projects there we, for instance, work on is we ask, how does AI shape the future of work representation? Right? Not just work, not just managers, but actually worker representation. And then the last one is uh, on people analytics. SET is the one which um, Georg will introduce in a moment. We also work on social innovation and social entrepreneurship, questions about how do organizations bring in different values, right, meanings. So the business side and the sustainability side or the business side and the social side, how do you integrate them in an organization is, is that. Um, last si uh, section, platforms and ecosystems, is really about um, I mean, digital platforms and maybe focusing a bit more on like a third way, an alternative perspective on platforms. So between, I mean, simply put, between China and the US, what would be a European alternative to, platform, to the platform economy? Um, and the Alternative Platform Project just published a report a couple of weeks ago, and the Inca project is starting soon. And yeah, last, I mean, last two sentences on this. As you see, we try to be quite creative with the names. So Kiwi is Künstliche Intelligenz und Wissensarbeit. So that's the Kiwi part of it. Inca is the in for increasing, then corporate, and then I think accountability, that's where the Inca comes from. So we also come up with really nice names. And what the set stands for and what is behind all that is now, um, well, Georg will talk about that next. And then we're looking forward to a conversation afterwards. Thank you. I just wanted to hide it. <laughs> sorry, one more slide, one more slide, sorry, sorry. I, I thought I'll just also point out a couple of publications, right? Um, a bit of a, a glimpse into some of the publications that we, we have. Um, one is um, a report that we published this year on the promises and perils of AI in social entrepreneurship, right? So we're wondering how do social ventures engage with AI, right? And maybe uh, also we, we publish normal kind of academic articles. This is an essay about, desire, um, about desirable futures where we effectively question academic thinking that is oftentimes very retrospective. So the brief uh, kind of summary of this is most scholarship builds on data that exists, but if we can only do research on data that exists, we can only do retrospective research, right? And uh, I mean, one, one argument in that piece is we say, if Trump throws a steak at us, I can analyze the steak. But if I want a vegetarian alternative and it doesn't exist, I cannot analyze it. Right? So how can we do prospective theorizing? How do we actually co-create futures as academics? Which is again very much linked to um, kind of our role as, as the HIC, right? What is the role of academia here? Is it just analyzing or is it actually even co-creating? And if we talk about co-creating, what is then our actually right to do so as, as scholars? And the last uh, kind of um, hint is we also have um, digital lunch talks. This is one on grand challenges, digitalization and sustainability. So three more are coming up this year where we engage with these topics um, um, digitally with colleagues from quite a range of, of disciplines, so very interdisciplinary. And now I really hand over to Georg uh, to talk about SET. Okay, so welcome from my side as well. Um, glad to see so many faces and familiar faces here as well. So uh, what I want to introduce to you is, first of all, the project Sustainability, Entrepreneurship and Global Digital Transformation. And then afterwards, I want to speak about one particular format that we think is quite relevant when it comes to kind of trying to make an impact in the Global South as researchers in the Global North without kind of, kind of just exposing your ideas on the Global South uh, and so on. So, but just give you a bit of background about the project. So this project is, um, is funded by 
GIZ, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, on behalf of BMZ, the German Federal Ministry of, for Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, maybe yeah, it's good to, to know a little bit, bit about this. So basically what um, GIZ has been doing recently uh, in the last uh, five to ten years is to think about development and cooperation work more through the lens of digitalization and digitalization. So they've been kind of having a lots of different projects and at some point uh, they, they came up with the idea to build so-called uh, digital transformation centers. These are centers, GIZ is kind of building in lots of different countries where they're already active. And these centers are very much focused on digitalization. So for let's say, and what they actually focus on in, in the different countries that varies a lot and that depends and of course always on what is kind of needed most, what their political partners prioritize at the time. So for instance, in Rwanda, they may be focused on uh, entrepreneurship, whereas in other, in other areas, it might be m more focused on kind of building digital literacy. So it really varies a lot. And uh, so uh, what kind of we um, have like the privilege to do is for, for this uh, yeah, uh, range of from November uh, last year to April next year, we are seeing uh, something like the um, academic interface for 10 of these digital transformation centers which have been fairly recently built, so they're kind of still looking for uh, expertise and connections and so on. And so we basically try to uh, provide that. And I think what's maybe important to know, so we are not, um, as, as HIC, we're not primarily only doing research, but we also have a lot of people who are very much engaged in science communication and transfer formats, which means essentially that we don't necessarily only conduct research, but we also try to think about creatively about ways to transfer knowledge, uh, enable knowledge exchange and so on. So concretely, what does that mean? So, um, so we have uh, lots of activities planned within these one and a half years. So we have uh, two research sprints and I will introduce that concept in more depth in a minute. Then we have uh, 11 stakeholder dialogues where we bring people together from academia, um, science, but also politics, business and civil society to engage in dialogues on particular topics. We have studies of course, and we have public ev events. Public events, the aim is always rather, rather than have an in-depth conversation about topic, it's more like raising um, kind of awareness for a particular issue that might be relevant uh, to a civil society. So these are kind of the activities we have planned. And yeah, just to give you an idea about these, uh, where these 10 transformation centers are based, so most of them are actually in, in uh, Western Africa, so in Benin, Cameroon, uh, Ghana, and uh, Niger. But they are also, um, we also uh, cooperate with uh, a DTC in Kenya and Morocco. And uh, in addition, uh, in Asia now, this fall, we will be in v Vietnam and Indonesia and, um, and also next year, Mexico. And, and what's also interesting is in Kosovo, for instance, there's this project um, where they have this former NATO base, which is more like coming from architectural uh, viewpoint, kind of th thinking about ways how to repurpose this uh, NATO base uh, area uh, f um, for, for civil society. And uh, so today I will particularly actually focus on uh, Ghana and uh, in the context of uh, the research sprint. Um, before that, it's maybe still worthwhile to kind of uh, briefly explain how we, um, what our approach is in these cases. So how do we uh, proceed, especially when it comes to kind of uh, choosing topics that we actually study and uh, formats. So we always start first of all by um, kind of identifying uh, local needs. So this happens in close cooperation with the digital transformation centers on the ground. And uh, because of course these have been built there and are active for several years already. And they're not only let's say GEZ consultants from Germany and so on, but they also have of course uh, people who work there who are locals. And in addition, they work very closely with their political partners. So for instance, in the case of Benin, where we were in, uh, in, in June, it's a ministry for digitization, so Benin actually has a ministry for digitization also for quite a while. So they kind of talk closely about the, t the topics and priorities. And uh, so we had uh, like lots, of, um, lots of different uh, meetings where we talked to, to both the DTCs as well as their partners to kind of come up with the questions we want to address. And then next we would kind of um, yeah, co-creatively develop these questions and take into consideration of course what we have to offer at the HIC, what expertise we have not only at the HIC maybe, but also at the network of centers, which are our partner institutes. And then last but not least, we would kind of think about uh, formats to address these research questions and to develop uh, knowledge for, for people that they can actually use in the end. Okay, so research sprints. Um, so I think uh, maybe it's hopefully obvious that research sprints is a, like a metaphor. So it's not like people actually sprinting 
Uh, however, from a, from a scientific perspective or from an academia point of view, it can actually a bit, uh, feel that way uh, in terms of the, the timing we have. So the idea of uh, research prints was, um, we think, pioneered by um, like a partner institute of ours, um, Bergman Klein, which is something like the Hick, but not in Berlin, but at Harvard. And so the idea is um, that, uh, basically, the idea is that the research projects of, often last uh, several years, so can be like multi-year projects. And of course, that's something that is also necessary. We don't want to replace that, but oftentimes it just takes too long to kind of come up with uh, until these, uh, let's say, reports and studies and so on are published, right? And uh, policymakers often often need more timely feedback um, from researchers. So here, the idea is: okay, research print are timely. So um, instead of let's say uh, working on something several years, the goal is to generate knowledge within several weeks or months. Um, and in addition, however, uh, or at the same time, however, I think they are still, let's say, allow for more depth than uh, like classical forms like conferences. So like, like being here today, this is great, of course, that we can have this conversation, like hear about different sessions, discuss them, and so on. But then, of course, maybe after the conference, you think, oh, actually, this one talk, I got this nice idea, and then you would discuss it further. But then, then it's not really a format, right, where you can follow up on this. So the idea of research prints is that you have several sessions for two months, so people kind of bring in their perspectives, talk about it, and then they can also come back and uh, take the discussion further. So second, they're uh, international interdisciplinary. Um, so I think that's quite important, of course, to uh, understand, especially issue related uh, to digitization, sustainability from multiple perspectives. So it's not enough to have, say, when you talk about the gig economy, to have an economist, but we also want to have a sociologist, a someone with a legal background, uh, and with a policy-making background, because all these perspectives also um, matter intensely when we uh, come when we talk about regulating such markets, for instance. And um, yeah, and of course, like uh, when it comes to especially issues like climate change, because it doesn't stop at at borders, it's important to have people from different countries uh, there as well. Uh, last but not least, they are open and flexible. So the idea is that that you start with a relatively broad topic, that you then narrow it more down over time. So then questions can be adapted over the time. And so can uh, yeah, research foci and what kind of data you use and uh, so on. So just to give you uh, one example, um, already uh, announced it. So um, we had this one research sprint in um, in summer, early summer, on uh, sustainable digital economies in Ghana. And here the, uh, goal, the goal was really to uh, inform practitioners and policymakers in Ghana about the, the country's uh, online uh, gig work ecosystem. So when you talk about online gig work. So it doesn't, the gig work, often you think about maybe Uber drivers and so on. So that's not what it's meant here. It's more meant something like uh, you have a platform where people upload gigs. Let's say I'm, we need someone that helps us with, with the report, let's say graphic design, and then can, people can apply for this. So this online gig work uh, kind of has, of course, a lot of potential in terms of that it can, let's say, people from all over the world can kind of get gigs that, uh, maybe, uh, that, that we upload here, let's say, in Germany. So that brings a lot of opportunities. But there are also still a lot of limitation to it, and um, yeah, those are some key facts. So overall, we had 11 fellows from nine countries and eight disciplines, and uh, so they worked together online for most of the time. And in the end, we had the closing week in Ghana, and so uh, we had a lot of different outputs. So we, in the closing week, um, uh, so basically the sprints engaged with conversations with uh, local ministries, local innovation agencies, and so forth. And then also there was a stakeholder dialogue and event. And there will also be a study coming out of it. And I thought it's just maybe nice to uh, show you a couple of uh, images so that, that it becomes a bit more uh, concrete. So here you can see one of the sessions that was uh, online where the sprints uh, met and, yeah, and, and engaged in, a, in their weekly session and discussed their progress and so on. Um, so um, this gives you a bit of an idea. So um, yeah, and maybe also it's interesting to know kind of when you facilitate something like this, it's, it's relatively complex, so it's not like giving like an academic lecture or a seminar. So it's a very different dynamic. So it's really good to have uh, not only academic guidance, but also have facilitators and moderators and have these roles also clearly separated to actually um, enable that. It's a proper, um, proper research brand. So then maybe some, uh, yeah, some, some impressions from the, uh, from the closing week. So this was um, at the Labour Ministry in Accra in Ghana. So where basically the, the fellows presented the, the sprint results and discussed them with them and maybe also try to understand the perspective of the, of the policy makers, kind of why regulating this, this uh, online gig work space is so, uh, so complicated. And then uh, towards the end of the week, um, 
Okay, the one one more uh, picture here of uh, Ghana Innovation Hub. Um, people also engaged conversations, and then there was this multi-stakeholder dialogue. dialogue um, so, uh, which essentially, um, where we often use something like the World uh, Cafe method. So, the idea is to have different tables that which focus on different topics, but then the groups themselves are quite mixed. So, there are often people like from academia, politics, business, and so on, so that they actually engage in a conversation. Again, here, of course, it's good to think a lot about facilitation and what you need to have the get the conversation started and and so on, and, and, and uh, how to actually um, document findings uh, in the meantime. And then towards the end of the stakeholder dialogues, the different uh, tables would often then basically just uh, present their findings to the other tables, which could basically uh, discuss different topics. And then we document them and um, provide like a synthesis and document and share that with all uh, participants. Uh, last but not least, there was like a, a, like a panel discussion. Um, so uh, here again, uh, as I said before, the idea was not, let's say, to have like an in-depth discussion with like everyone, but there were like three panelists who brought in different perspectives, and just kind of more raise uh, awareness in in, in 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 Ghana society uh, for this issue. And uh, I think it was actually quite a success because we didn't have only this panel, but and we live streamed it, but also it was afterwards and live streamed on. Uh, radio in Ghana, so lots of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people heard about generally like the opportunity that comes along with online gig work, but also kind of some of the problems. Now the topic here was of course when we talk uh, today about sustainability here, obviously it was more focused on like say social uh, sustainability, on, on decent work and so on, uh, but in the overall project we also have uh, other topics focused, so our um, um, next research sprint will be uh, on, um, on more on, on green tech in Vietnam. Um, maybe just some key findings. Uh, so what, what did the fellows uh, learn? So first of all, there were a lot of uh, legal uncertainties. So when it comes to online gig work, so the, the status of gig workers is oft, often not clear. What does that mean or imply? It means, for instance, that they often, it's not clear whether they actually have a right to unionize. And moreover, for the government, it was often quite difficult to say, okay, how can we enforce minimal, minimal legal wage? Because it wasn't clear who's the employer. Is the employer, let's say, a person in Berlin who's uploading the gig to do the graphic design for a study, or is it the platform? So kind of the same discussion that we're having also uh, in Europe uh, about the status of, of these uh, workers. Uh, second, uh, it was noted there were a lot of geographical challenges in terms of that, the, uh, that there's a strong um, urban-rural divide, so that uh, most of the profit uh, projects accumulate in metropolitan areas such as Accra, which is of course a, a pity given that it, it would provide potentially a chance that people can kind of stay in their villages and smaller cities uh, and kind of do this kind of work. However, there's this trend that, um, that this is accumulating in, in metropolitan areas. Uh, last but not least, um, uh, there was also a big discussion about skill-related challen challenges. So what um, people noted is that you don't only, let's say, need the design, uh, the graphic design skills, but you also need these kind of uh, self-management skills, entrepreneurial skills. You need kind of to be able to navigate the platform, know how to find gigs, how to kind of promote yourself, create a profile that then it kind of is in, uh, looks in a way that people will actually say, oh, I want to give that task to that person or not. So a lot of skills involved, um, which at this time are something, some, sometimes still lacking on the one hand. And on the other hand, that was another issue is that often uh, workers didn't have like a clear picture of what skills are actually valued in these online labor markets. So what skills are maybe valued not only now, but also in, ten, in two years so they can adjust in, 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 the, in the meantime and uh, acquire these skills. Okay, so that's something I mentioned briefly. So the next research sprint, um, we will start uh, next month, actually, on the 11th Oct October. Um, with the, and so it will, again, take place mostly online, but there will be a closing week in, in, in Vietnam. And here the question is really very much focused on uh, green technology uh, entrepreneurship. So basically, in Vietnam, it's a country which is extremely affected by climate change due to rising sea levels, typhoons, and so on. So they really have to kind of make this energy transition, and there are a lot of reports coming uh, out uh, these days and kind of looking at priorities. And one big priority uh, for Vietnam is uh, green tech to make the transition both in transport but also the energy sector and so on. 
However, um, I mean, uh, Vietnam is a, a communist country, so a lot, the, for instance, in energy, there's like a state-owned enterprise which almost con controls 100% of the energy market, which makes innovation, of course, a lot more complicated than, let's say, um, in, in, in France or, or Germany or so on. And uh, so, therefore, like, there's a question of kind of what obstacles do green tech entrepreneurs currently face? On the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, from the kind of investor side, what factors promote or inhibit investor, in, investment in green tech startups? So these are kind of the questions which are very dear to the heart of the people who are, we are collaborating with uh, in Vietnam at the, at the moment. And so we will again have, uh, we do the sprint and have a multi-stakeholder dialogue and a public events. So we will present the findings at the uh, Green Economy Forum exhibition in 2022 in Ho Chi Minh City uh, on the 30th of November. Uh, so basically, um, and, yeah, and having something like this in mind, of course, is also helpful for the fellows to have a clear goal and they can actually have uh, something they can focus on. So, um, yeah, that's something, and uh, last but not least, what I wanted to mention also is when, then in the end, how can we, in a, in a way, kind of scale this knowledge that we, that we kind of collect in all these different places and these different transformation centers, and how can we kind of provide it in a way, let's say, to, to also maybe other um, digital transformation centers, which are not in Vietnam, but maybe have similar conditions and so on, and similar problems. And then what this one idea we had is to kind of uh, create a hub for digitalization project descriptions, so it's the idea is to, to have this like a place where you can basically um, chronicle cases, let's say, at the intersection of digitalization and sustainability, and so that people can kind of share insights and learn from each other. And we currently actually have an open call, so if you're interested in that, uh, so just Google knowledge, knowledge Exchange Digitalization or uh, take a picture. And uh, so for the first cases, there's also some um, incentive uh, involved. So that's one idea we have also then to uh, kind of document the findings in addition to having studies and, and, and panel discussions and, uh, and, and live streams and so on. So um, yeah, this was such some input. Uh, so again, uh, I think this research sprint format can be really interesting if you want to kind of avoid just kind of, let's say, flying to a place and just holding a presentation, but collaboratively both exchanging and, um, and generating knowledge. And uh, so yeah, we look forward to have to, just to discussion and we have, I think, 10 more minutes for, for Q&A. Thank you very much. Who wants to have ask a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. That was super interesting. I definitely going to look at the projects. Um, I'm just wondering um, the transfer f of knowledge you gather to the specific region or regions, the different ones. Um, you're probably going to look at entrepreneurship, how you can actually change the education, entrepreneurship education, how you're going to include um, the aspect of maybe purpose or sustainability. I'm just wondering how or in which ways you are going to basically, like all the gatherings you make, turn, turn them back again to your, to your collaboration partners. I'll take the easy part to start, and if you want to chip in, then um, I'll hand over to Georg. I think the key thing is, like, with these projects, we change what it means to be an academic, right? So normally academia is very distant, you go there, you have a question, etc., etc. This is speedy, but it's also actually the, the role of the um, academic becomes that of a moderator. So we come with expertise on digitalization, we have certain values as well, but actually we go in the field and are quite open towards seeing their problems, right? So it's not that we come there with our predefined problems, but we say, so what are your problems? And then we use the toolkits we have, so in a way, I guess, what do we use? We use our human capital, or our knowledge. We use our social capital, our network. So we are part of a network of centers of over 100 inter institutes. We use our financial capital. We have some resources as well. And I guess we use our cultural capital. We motivate people on the ground also to pursue certain things. That's, I guess, the, the generic answer. But um, yeah, maybe, Georg, you want to continue on that? Uh, yes, so maybe it's a good question. I think um, we had the same discussion after the, the talk before about the, the reset report. So now the report is done, but what actually now happens with it, how do policy makers and so on learn about it? And I think in this project we have the advantage that we have these tr kind of these formats like the stakeholder dialogues and the events already built into the Antrag, so, uh, so into, into, into the grant agreement. So actually basically when we, uh, when we go to, to Mexico, we will uh, next year we will have the uh, results of the sprint and of a study and discuss it in the stakeholder look with policymakers and have this public event 
And uh, I think the good thing is that there are these digital transformation centers, and let's say now we go back in March next year, but the DTCs are not going anywhere. So they're still there, and for them it's one of their, let's say, three key resources whenever they discuss a topic, let's say, okay, well, we have this report on this topic, and another report on another topic, and so basically they can refer to it. So I think that's a bit of an advantage that we have in this project, the transfer formats are already built into the, uh, the grant agreement. Thank you. We also have online. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, my name is Alejandra. I'm from Colombia. I'm an ecologist, so not that, that into entrepreneurship. I have two questions. One is regarding a little bit what she said. Is are, are you going to monitor how, or for the future, how these stakeholder dialogues uh, evolve, or if they get really into a policy change, or are you going to monitor that in, in one way? And another question is regarding language. Um, you are in different parts, so I wanted to know what languages are you talking? Is this all English-based? Does this create a filter for participation? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for the questions maybe first of all about uh, languages. So, um, so given that the, that, the, in the, that the fellows come from lots of different places, you can see uh, as so often academia, then the, the go-to language is English. So uh, people are in English. However, so now for instance, in the, when we do the sprint in Vietnam, there were also a lot of applicants from Latin America, especially Mexico. So what we now do is we form two, two groups. Uh, also that, uh, or we think about forming two groups is um, basically so that the people can also uh, engage in Spanish because there were also some who, let's say, are not so fluent in English and maybe feel more comfortable kind of uh, contributing the perspective in that. And uh, so for instance, when we were in Benin, uh, because it's such a fr uh, Francophone uh, uh, country, so um, we also, for instance, uh, decided that we actually uh, write the study in French because otherwise no one uh, would actually read it and benefit from it. Um, so we had, we're very lucky that we have a scholar from uh, Canada who's originally from, from, from Niger and he uh, is, but, yeah, is now in Ottawa. So he's both fluent in uh, French and English. And so, so basically we could discuss and everything, but then he will write ultimately the this, this study in French. But in addition, we will do an exit executive summary in English so that people who don't speak French can actually also at least get the gist of it. And uh, what was the first, first question? Right, and yeah, and that's maybe a, a big issue. Maybe Ali can say something about this, but it's also a big uh, discussion in science in general, I think, right? How to monitor that. Yeah, and so maybe I think again, what is our role? Again, it's changing in terms of like the, from what the normal academic is doing. I think we are not just moderators, but actually orchestrators, right? So when Georg says we, we actually commission some of the studies, right? Because we're saying we are not the expert. We don't speak the language, but also the local language. But we know, let's say, the system and we enable others to work further. So even with the case studies, um, like we kind of try to be the platform for others, right? So in terms of then um, like output and so on, I mean, the GZ has certain KPIs, right? In terms of reach, etc. We will have a follow-up um, probably project with the GZ. But I think what's also key is for us, like when we write the proposal, we try to be only a piece of the puzzle and the puzzle should also continue without us, right? And so the GZ, as, as Georg said, will stay there in these different centers and have an institutionalized presence, right? And we, we like, I mean, before, in, my, in the previous life, I was a consultant, right? So you fly in, you go in for a week, and then you're out again, right? And that's obviously, it's, uh, it's not very healthy, right? And so we see ourselves really as enabling those who are on the ground there to then continue these things. So yes, there are KPIs. At the same time, I mean, I'm a core scholar. I think Georg also is primarily a core scholar. We are also very hesitant because obviously things, not, not all things that, that are good can be measured, right? And oftentimes it is, I mean, the radio, for instance, forecast, um, broadcast at radio, we don't know whether that has an impact, right? And how many people then change their behavior. So a lot of these things cannot be measured, but we, we, we try to yeah, keep a track and institutionalize beyond our own engagement. Thank you. Hi, um, I actually come, my name is Camilo. I come from Mexico, so I'm very interested in your uh, visit to Mexico. If you can send, or where can I get more information about that uh, next visit? And I have a social project. Uh, we use open hardware and open so software, sorry. And we bring education to um, rural Mayan villages without internet access. So is there a way we can find a way to collaborate with an institute, maybe? 
or how can we do that? Thank you. Uh, yes, you can uh, basically when you go to our website, there's also a live ticker on the activities that are going on in the set project specifically. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out also after the conference. And uh, maybe there's some 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 uh, format where we can collaborate. So it would be interesting. More questions? Yeah, uh, I will, we'll gather them first. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob Zwiers. Uh I used to be a scientist, but at the moment I work for the Berlin Development Agency. Um, my question is, with your project, with your approach, you put a very, very intense question up front when it comes to what is actually the, the functionality of science itself. So my question would be, where do you see the limitations of what, what I would call engaged science, because you are very and maybe too much into it, and in, in the thick of it. I will first get some more questions. Thank uh, so my name is Thomas Hapenow. I'm from the Accenture Development Partnerships Program here in Germany. And um, I would be curious to understand your view on the gig economy. You mentioned the example in Ghana. Um, because it's a way of embedding local workers into international value chains. So what's your assessment on the long-term positive or negative impact for uh, sustainable structural development of similar countries? Thank you. Another question I can... We can already address now. No, okay, then I hand back to you. Thank you. So I'll, I'll address your question um, because this is something I actually write about and there's a huge debate in academia on engaged scholarship and Vannevin who just died wrote a book on engaged scholarship, uh, Hoffman wrote a book on the engaged scholar. So this is a topic which is quite hot right now, right? What, what's the role of an academic uh, in, in these things? Uh, and I mean, when we teach, obviously we teach uh, students like you are, um, when they do participant observation, you observe the moment you engage, you also, I mean, you infiltrate, you shape the field, etc. right? You kind of, you might shape and put your own biases on this, right? So all these things are important, right? Especially in a global context, right? Who are we in the moment you obviously even enter, right? So if you if you enter a field, your identity is something which is seen and all that is has an impact, right? Like, so if we go to the global south and we look white, for instance, or whatever, then that has an impact on maybe how people converse, right? So for a qualitative scholar, for scholars generally, all these things have to be considered. Some of them can be trained as in like, with ethnographic scholarship. Others are just there by, I guess, by situation, right? And then what, what, I've written a piece on contextual expertise where um, I try to argue for um, like bringing in other um, scholars, etc., and um, certain methods. But I guess my, my quick response is, uh, on the other side though, what I like about engaged scholarship is that we are not just sitting back and watch, but actually um, co-create, right? And so that, it creates a lot of new tensions. But I think there's also a lot of power behind that. And the challenge for that on the other side, though, is it is still very much uh, delegitimized by the field. So within academia, so I mean, my, my PhD students, for instance, with them, it's a very careful process because in academia itself, it's still something yeah, which is, doesn't have the same legitimacy as distant positivist scholarship. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the question. And I think it's, it's a good one. Uh, however, I mean, Ali in the beginning showed the slide with all the people who work in the Innovation Entrepreneurship Research Group. And so this particular question was kind of more coordinated by Fabian Stefani, who's like a leading expert on the gig economy, especially on gig work. And uh, I'm more than happy to uh, connect you to, because I think it's, uh, I can't really uh, answer this question uh, conclusively or any you got. Then I think we are now one minute over time. Um, so I will close this session. Thank you very much. Also, thank you for your questions, and have a, thank you, uh, and have a great rest of Bits and Bäume.